to invest in rail infrastructure, I guess. Um, thanks for giving us your time for this important announcement. Uh, I'm Lance Foreman. We have Lucy Harris, John Longworth, Anunciata Rees-Mogg. Uh, we shall all be speaking um, fairly briefly. Um, before we do, though, uh, we have just released a video onto social media, uh, which we'll be playing first. Of course, we'll have questions and answers afterwards. Because we don't have a press officer, we'd really appreciate it if you can say who you are and which organisation you're from um, before asking your, your questions. Um, there will be um, electronic versions of our speeches, uh, should you wish to have uh, copies of them afterwards. And uh, without further ado, um, we will kick off with the, uh, the video. Thank you. I'm Lucy Harris. And I'm John Longworth, and we are all Brexit Party MEPs. We stood for elections in May this year because we believe Britain's independence to the EU would lead to a brighter future for our country. And because we are passionate Democrats who believe the result of the referendum must be fulfilled. And because under Theresa May, despite her words, Brexit did not mean Brexit. We joined Nigel Farage, one of the greatest campaigners of our time. And our success in European elections with the Brexit Party changed the course of history for good. Every general election brings different issues to the fore. Whether it's the economy or taxes, our defences, or winters of discontent. This election was brought about by the political crisis of Brexit. The damage to continued uncertainty is doing to our economy and the international humiliation that is heaped upon us. Boris Johnson says we must get Brexit done, and he is right. Brexit is the number one issue this time around. To everyone's surprise, Boris Johnson brought back a new deal from the EU before the 31st of October deadline. A remarkable achievement, given that Parliament has tied his hands. And whilst this deal is not perfect, it is sufficient to remove us from the gridlock. The key to Brexit's success is no longer the deal, but how we use the opportunities afforded by Brexit. And how successfully we can negotiate the terms of our future arrangements with the EU and others. Our country needs the determination to succeed and a much stronger negotiating team than we have had to date. On the back of assurances from Boris on no further delays and no political control from the EU. Nigel Farage accepted that the deal was good enough to stand down 317 Brexit Party candidates and that the Conservatives remain unchallenged in the seats they hold. But we believe, if Boris's deal is good enough, why fight Conservatives anywhere they stand a chance of winning? This risks splitting the Leave vote and allowing a Corbyn coalition for government and destroys our ambitions for Brexit. We could end up with a Labour Party that is more extreme and unpatriotic than we have ever seen. We believed that the Brexit Party should only stand in 20 seats around the country, seats they could win. Seats with both large Labour and Leave majorities, where the Brexit Party could make a difference. But things have changed. This would have been a good plan had we started there. And if the Brexit Party had focused its resources in a few key constituencies, despite the polls, the outcome of this election is unpredictable at constituency level. It is unlikely that the Brexit Party will win any seats. So we are recommending that all Brexit supporters now vote Conservative. To support Boris Johnson's deal, as every single Conservative Party candidate has pledged. Even if you and your family have never voted Conservative before, this is a unique time in history. We voted for change in 2016. So let's not be afraid to make a change ourselves. We have a great future ahead of us, but only we can make it happen by making the right decisions. If you want Brexit, and if you believe in democracy, there is only one option now. And like us, you have to change your vote and support Boris Johnson's Conservative Party. Thank you. When Boris Johnson came back from Brussels with his new deal, the Brexit Party initially declared it the second worst deal in history, yet implored the Conservatives to work together it went on to threaten the Tories with a nationwide slate of general election candidates um, before removing half the threat on the basis that it wasn't quite such a bad deal after all. I took a different approach, 
an approach guided by my many years of experience in business. If I told customers they make the second worst bread in history um, and then tried to sell them my smoked salmon, I wouldn't be in business for very long. Um, instead, I would praise the positive aspects of their loaves, I would help them improve the recipe and assure them that with my product between the slices, they'd have the tastiest sandwich ever, irresistible in fact. Sadly, I've come to the conclusion that the Brexit party strategy is misguided. It jeopardises the chance to become an independent country at the very moment victory is in sight. If Boris Johnson's deal is good enough to stand down 317 candidates and not fight the Tories in their existing seats, why on earth are we competing with them elsewhere? In fairness, the Tories could probably have been uh, more generous to the Brexit party after its role in securing a new leader in Boris, but we shouldn't let pride get in the way of delivering the outcome of the referendum. Boris has a fine line to tread uh, to keep those on side who voted Remain but believe foremost in democracy, and those who might switch to the Lib Dems and in so doing risk a Corbyn-led alliance. We should be more intelligent and sensitive to this, or we risk no Brexit at all. After all, if the consequence of the Brexit party is to deny us pro-Brexit MPs in just a dozen seats, we could see a new occupant in number 10. Having stood alongside Boris Johnson at Vote Leave during the referendum and alongside Nigel Farage in the Brexit party, I can assure you that both are equally committed to delivering Brexit. One might say that Boris has the tougher task as he has to carry non-believers and make the hard choices that government involves. In spite of this, it was due to Boris's excellent card play and poker-style bluff that the EU caved in on the backstop and agreed significant changes to the political declaration. The 27 couldn't be certain whether Boris would sign that extension letter or whether he would break the law. The key thing going forward is not the withdrawal deal, but appointing a new, streetwise and commercially experienced negotiating team, or teams with an S, um, and comprising only those who share the positive vision for Brexit. We should be negotiating deals simultaneously with the United States, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, whilst also forging ahead with the EU. Each negotiation will help strengthen the other. Now, I joined the Brexit party earlier this year when Theresa May crossed a red line. She invited Jeremy Corbyn into 10 Downing Streets to discuss a cross-party solution to Brexit and for the future of our country. I knew at that point she'd lost the plot. One moment she branded Corbyn unfit to lead, the next she provided him with unprecedented credibility. I said then he was an anti-Semitic Marxist who I could never support, but now we know even more. Corbyn is dishonest over his tax promises. He's incoherent over Brexit. He will be weak with our security and the threats we face, and he will bankrupt the country faster than you could say Venezuela. Everyone knows that the reason for the austerity our country had endured was because Labour left the cupboards bare after 13 years in power, and they are promising the same again now. In fact, far, far worse. With their fairy tale offers of free this, free that, and free the other, once this is, election is over, the only thing we want free is to be free of Jeremy Corbyn. Now, despite resigning the whip, the Brexit Party whip, I, I think I speak on behalf of my colleagues in wanting to make one thing very clear. My decision is nothing personal towards Nigel Farage. It is largely due to his vision and persistence that becoming an independent country has moved over the past 20 years from being a, free, a fringe issue to a mainstream government policy. It has been a towering achievement, and he can stand proudly as one of the most influential political leaders of my lifetime. Now is the time to cement this legacy. Nigel should celebrate his victory, not put it at peril. Now, whilst this is not strictly Brexit-related, I do hope you will indulge me with a short personal tale. When I was 15 and studying history at school, part of the curriculum was the rise of fascism in Europe in the 1930s. A documentary film called Hitler happened to be showing that year with original footage in some cinemas and which a school friend and I thought would be quite helpful for our course. We entered the cinema and took our seats. What we didn't realise until the film started was that the entire auditorium was filled with leather-clad National Front thugs and skinheads. 
When the word Jew was mentioned, the audience started jeering. When a Jewish woman appeared on screen, they shouted, whore. My friend and I were petrified. As much as anything, petrified the thugs might notice we weren't participating. So God help me, we joined in. The son of a Holocaust survivor jeering at Jews to protect himself. Think about that. When the movie ended, many in the audience stood up, gave Nazi salutes and shouted, we'll be back. We slid away, shivering with fear, hoping no one would spot us. That awful memory had been totally erased from my mind for over 40 years until last Sunday. On Sunday, I saw on social media some footage of Matt Hancock, who is not Jewish, saying at a hustings that his worst fear of labor was the rise in anti-Semitism. The moment he said that, the Labour supporters who filled the room stood up jeering and mocking, truly vile, with real hatred in their voices. After 40 years, a genuine fear was awakened in me. Jewish people in Britain do not fear Corbyn. We know precisely who he is and what he stands for. What we fear is living in a country that is so unconcerned with anti-Semitic racism that such a man can be elected. That is the nightmare we are facing. We need to vote Conservative now for three reasons. Because a vote for the Brexit Party, or the Lib Dems if you're that way inclined, risks splitting the Conservative vote and opening the door to Corbyn and his cronies. Two, only the Tory party under Boris will actually get Brexit done and dusted. So we can focus on creating the wealth we need to provide the services we want. And three, we are at a historic crossroads. We can let Corbyn into power by default to a future I don't even want to contemplate. Or in voting for Boris, we can choose a positive, uplifting future for our country filled with entrepreneurialism, innovation, internationalism, free speech, safety, and hope. Thank you very much. Lucy. Hi everyone, I'm Lucy Harris. Um, so today, I am incredibly sad to leave many good Brexit party people behind and resign the Brexit party whip. Many of them are worthy candidates and incredibly accomplished people. Their PPCs have shown some of the best of British through their instinct of perseverance and initiative, which we much needed for the future. I can't say I haven't had a furious internal battle over not being able to help them more and to support their bravery in standing as candidates for the Brexit party. But this election is unlike any other, a turning point in history. And with an anti-Semitic Marxist at our doorsteps, quite literally, we have to channel our bravery in a very different direction. With Jeremy Corbyn threatening to hold a rigged second referendum between Remain and a fake leave option that keeps us permanently trapped under EU control and of all EU's institutions, we have to be realistic about the options in front of us. And under the UK's first past the post electoral system, it is clear that there is only one way to guarantee that Jeremy Corbyn cannot reserve reverse Brexit and unleash his Marxist nightmare on the country. And that is why, by voting for the Conservative Party, you enable Conservative majority to keep him out. Now, I know this is not conventional, but I want the UK public to take a moment, take a step back, and glance at the past two decades of how our social and cultural narrative has changed. Whether it's closing down of free speech, overbearing political correctness, accumulating in oppressive safe spaces and no platform culture, the disrespect of tradition, our values, our family, even the negative politicization of the love for our home, everything we hold dear and everything we are, Labour have been intent on pushing that change. Labour are at the root of this. Labour embody this negative attitude. And it is now reflected more strongly than ever in their current leadership 
and manifesto under Jeremy Corbyn. This election, we are at a crossroads. Vote for Corbyn's Labour, and they will have free reign to impose this regressive way of life on us, instead of the common sense, respect, fair play, and goodwill that is the foundation of British society. Vote for Corbyn's Labour, and they will have Brexit being cancelled altogether. This may be the last time in a very long time that ordinary people can change the destiny of our communities and their homes for the better. However, I did not get involved in politics to fight against something. I got involved in politics to fight for something and call me naive, call me a dreamer, but I believe in the ordinary person. Give ordinary people the chance to speak and they and we will tell you the obvious truths which have been in front of your nose all along, just like we did with Brexit three years ago. For me, Brexit was never about one person versus one institution, but lighting that spark of self-determination shown by ordinary people in 2016. And I will not let that flicker of hope die out. I stand for a country where mold breaking, risk taking, standing up for yourself is rewarded, where individual rights are at the core of government policy, where we do not doubt ourselves, where we give people a chance, whether in debate or in opportunity, where we don't write people off for having the wrong ideas, where we are brave enough to find out where free and open debate and conversation may take us. And that is what is so exciting about a free and independent world. You never know where it might take you, but on an exploration into future without limits. And Brexit showed that ordinary people have the balls to go there. Now, I have met many people on my three-year journey into politics up and down the country. I indeed run my own campaign. All brave and independently-minded individuals, and I ask for those who have been on my journey with me and followed my progress, who have given me the privilege of their intention to allow me the honour of their trust once again, and encourage them to vote for the only party that can actually deliver a real Brexit, to rescue that flicker of hope, to save our home from Marxism, to get Brexit done and unleash Britain into the future. On December the 12th, please change your vote to Boris and vote for the Conservative Party. Merry Christmas. Hello, uh, my name's John Longworth. Do please let me know if you can't hear what I'm saying. Uh, they had to put subtitles on the video because of my Yorkshire accent. Uh, so don't be shy. Um, I think we're all coming at this from different places, as you'll see as we give our presentations. And I wanted to share with you my Brexit journey, um, which started a long time ago, actually. When I was a very young executive, I was appointed to sit on Mrs Thatcher's deregulation task force and at the same time I was also working on the single market program for the corporate that I was working for and that experience taught me a couple of things first of all um, the program was being run by the DTI uh, and the DTI did everything possible to frustrate deregulation and to promote European integration and it was also being headed up by Michael Heseltine who had no intention whatsoever of fulfilling any of the uh, promises that were being made to the public. What it taught me was that the Whitehall has an agenda and that some politicians are perfectly capable of saying one thing to the public and doing quite a different thing in fact. So right from the very beginning of my career, I've been a Eurosceptic. 
Uh, but, of course, when you're in business, you have to do the business. And it was only when we got to uh, the impending referendum campaign that I decided to stick my head above the parapet. You may recall uh, that the British Chambers of Commerce, which I headed up, actually put forward some criteria to David Cameron that he must bring back from Brussels for it to be a satisfactory deal. And the reason British Chambers did that was that I met businesses up and down the country who were having major difficulty exporting to Europe, didn't believe in the single market, and were actually doing better elsewhere. So it was a perfectly legitimate thing for us to do. Of course, he'd come back with none of the things that we'd asked him to come back with, uh, and then launched Project Fear. And it was the, pro the lies of Project Fear that inspired me to actually decide to call the government out. And despite being harangued and harassed by number 10, uh, that's exactly what I did at the British Chambers Conference. I was suspended and then subsequently resigned to fight the referendum campaign, which I did as chairman of the Vote Leave Business Council and sitting on the campaign committee with the likes of Boris Johnson. After the referendum was won, I was told that that was the end, uh, that we'd be like Japanese soldiers fighting in the jungle in the 1960s if we carried on campaigning for Brexit. They were wrong, of course, and I uh, volunteered to be chairman of Leave Means Leave, and one of the proudest moments I have had was leading the march to leave from Sunderland into Parliament Square that sunny day uh, where we protested that Brexit had not been delivered. I then joined uh, the Brexit Party as an MEP. I had one thing in mind and I actually explicitly stated the one thing, which was that I wanted to campaign for Brexit. And that's what the Brexit Party successfully did because we needed to remove the Hammond May regime. I feared at that point that we would lose Brexit and that is very likely what would have happened had we not actually won decisively that European election. But the Brexit party has morphed into something else, not just about Brexit at all. And as it's only Brexit that I'm interested in, then uh, it was right for me uh, to actually call out the Brexit party. Nigel Farage, in a newspaper article, referred to me as an ultra when he was suggesting that I'd gone through a metamorphosis of some description. Um, I am an ultra. He was right. But I'm also a businessman and a pragmatist, and I know when it's time to take the cake out of the oven. Not a half-baked cake, which is what May and Hammond were presenting us with, but also not a burnt cake that's actually going to crumble to nothing. I sat on that campaign committee with Boris Johnson. I sat on the bus with him going around the country campaigning for Brexit. I know that Boris Johnson leans very strongly towards the Brexit cause, that he's committed to delivering it. His deal is not perfect, I would say that the Brexit deal that he's put forward at the moment equates a little bit better than the Norway deal. However, it has the potential to be a great deal. And there's every possibility in the negotiations going forward that that's what the outcome will be. But as it stands at the moment, it is definitely Brexit, unlike the deal that we were presented with by the previous administration. And the thing that Brexiteers need to recognise anybody who voted to leave the European Union must recognise and those people of course up and down the country of which many people I know who voted not to leave but believe in democracy is that that deal is the only game in town the alternatives all the alternatives lead to revocation either directly or via a circuitous route it's massively important now that Boris Johnson's deal is delivered if we want to have Brexit. And therefore, I'm very happy 
to suggest, even if you have to hold your nose, vote Conservative in the upcoming election. Thank you. Thank you all for coming along today. This has not been an easy decision for any of us, but I think it's fair to say we all feel it's one we had no choice but to make. For the best part of a decade, I, for one, was very happy to keep out of politics and get on with my life. I did campaign for leave in 2016, but I was busy handing out leaflets, not going on television and standing in front of all these cameras. Something changed when Theresa May kept trying to betray the British people. Her deal that meant we would in fact be tied to the European Union did not honor the 2016 result. The anger across the country at her betrayal and the risk of us losing Brexit entirely made me realize I couldn't keep silent any longer. I joined the Brexit party, led by Nigel Farage, the individual who has arguably done more to support the Brexit cause and fight for British sovereignty than anyone else in our country. He is a formidable campaigner with a deep belief in our country. The European elections were an extraordinary result and showed just how strong the people's feelings, the voters felt about achieving Brexit. The results in May assured the end of May. They confirmed a Remainer could not win the Tory leadership and become Prime Minister. Boris won and surprised everyone with his deal in October. It wasn't perfect, but it was not May's surrender treaty. The Brexit party instantly wrote it off. We were told as MEPs that if there were an emergency vote held in the European Parliament, we would be whipped to vote against supporting Boris's deal. But Boris's deal, the withdrawal agreement, the political declaration, give the UK the ability to leave unilaterally and returns our own sovereignty. That is what most Brexiteers I've ever met have been fighting for, for decades. But it needs a strong government behind it to ensure that Brexit is the success it can be and to make sure that the British negotiating team have the strength to stand up for our country's best interests. The other issue is, of course, that Boris's deal is the only leave option we have. The only other options currently available are more damaging delays, a second remain, remain referendum, or straight revoke. By looking closely at the polls, but also talking to people across the country, the East Midlands that I am honored to represent most particularly, it is clear to me that the Brexit party is splitting the vote of leavers in marginal and not so marginal constituencies. If you look at the likes of Lincoln, of Gedling, of Sedgefield, of Hartlepool, of High Peak, Weaver Vale, Gower, Bolton Northeast, the list goes on and on. In Scotland, Wales and England, the Brexit party are permitting 
votes to go away from the Conservatives, providing us with a Remain coalition that will do anything not to honour the Brexit referendum. The votes they are taking are estimated, and I found it true on doorsteps, to come approximately two-thirds from the Conservative supporters, one-third from Labour. It is clear that those are damaging to getting levers into Parliament. I find it absolutely unbelievable but tragic that the Brexit Party, with so many wonderful people dedicated to a cause, are now the very party risking Brexit. I only stood in May to fight for Brexit. I am still determined to do so. If you, like me, support democracy, support our sovereignty, and support Brexit, then please, like me, use your vote to support the Conservatives and get us out of the EU. Thank you. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard from the four of us. Uh, we're now happy to take questions. Can I remind you, could you please say who you're from and <coughs> which organisation? Yes, we'll take one at the front. So. Hi, Chris Hope from Telegraph. Two quick questions. Have you been offered any, each of, each of you asked to answer the question, please, have you been offered any honours or roles in the government to quit the Brexit Party today? And how many more MEPs might quit before Election Day? Uh, on the first question, we haven't even had discussions uh, with the Conservative Party about what is happening today. The first they heard about it was the same time you heard about it, and uh, we had issued a resignation letter to Nigel Farage first, which we felt was the right thing to do. Um, so, no, none of us have had any discussions whatsoever. Uh, on the second question, um, other MEPs will, you know, make their own decisions. You know, we have come to this decision independently. Um, we've all arrived at the same destination, and, you know, we'll see what happens over the coming days. It, it could be that others, you know, feel sympathetic and decide that they want to follow us. We hope they do, and, and we hope that uh, many candidates around the country standing for the, the Brexit Party... Um, come to the same conclusion, and wouldn't it be wonderful if even Nigel Farage realised that this was the best decision to get Brexit done? Yes. Um, Vicky Young from BBC News. Uh, are you going to join the Conservative Party, any of you? And do you think that the Brexit Party now has any future at all? <clears throat> what we're concerned about right now is just getting Brexit, is just this general election to make sure that we have the strongest Conservative majority possible. So if anyone, uh, if any of uh, Tory uh, MPs want me to campaign with them, I'm happy to do so. But otherwise, <coughs> um, I'm just thinking on that. I'm just thinking about the general election. Uh, yes, in the middle. I'm Lister, Daily Express, and everything you've said here today, Corbyn's record on anti-Semitism, problems with first past the post, um, the Brexit Party's ability to split the vote, absolutely all of that was known on the day the election was called. So what has changed seven days from polling day to make you do this move? <coughs> the, the key thing is that uh, the Brexit Party has adopted a wrong strategy regarding Boris's deal and the way in which they go about running the election. And from my personal point of view, you know, I tried to get them on the right track. So it's taken a little bit of time to come to the conclusion that there's no hope. Um, back on the left there, from the white shirt. Uh, hello all, Dan Bloom from the Daily Mirror. Uh, just coming back to Christopher Hope's question. Uh, Lance, you said that uh, you've not had any discussions <coughs> about what's happening today with anyone from the Conservatives, but more generally, more widely, 
have any of you in turn had any approach from the Conservative Party about uh, roles or uh, honours or anything like that or about trying to persuade you to come over before this date? Not just about this event today, but generally. Thanks. Shall, shall we each answer that yeah, question so that you're absolutely clear? I've had no approaches whatsoever from the Conservative Party offering roles or honours. When Nigel Farage accused me of it for the third time, I said to him, how exciting do you know something I don't, because I don't. I have also had no approaches from the Conservative Party of any description, and I am frankly finding it really quite disturbingly old-fashioned that people are suggesting my brother gets to tell me what to do with my political views. He doesn't. We have completely independent views of each other. I'm only concerned about Brexit. No honours or any other promises have come anywhere near me, and I haven't spoken to anyone about it. They wouldn't be able to bribe me. This is purely, purely about Brexit. And likewise, nobody has come to me to offer me anything. I am deeply concerned about Brexit, and that is all I've been fighting for for the past three years, and that is what I will keep fighting for. And uh, it looks like we have a full house. Uh, Likewise, I haven't had any conversations with anybody about anything. You know, we, as I said, we, we came to, uh, well, not anything, anything to do with, uh, obviously, these discussions. We, we, you know, we, we've come to this conclusion ourselves. We've been discussing it, and uh, we, you know, we've come to the conclusion that you know, if, we, if we want to get Brexit done, this is the only way forward. The, 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 the risks of splitting the vote is just, they're, they're just far, far too dangerous. You know, if there had been a decision a few weeks back just to focus on a small number of seats, as John has said, maybe things would be different. But we, we, you know, things are very unpredictable now, and it's just too dangerous to take risks. Yes, the front. Hello, Tamara Cohen from Sky News. Um, the Brexit Party. You said you wanted a clean break, a no-deal Brexit. You didn't like Boris Johnson's deal. Have you changed your mind about that, or do you think a no-deal is still possible if he gets a majority? Um, Nigel Farage did say he, he wanted a no-deal, but he went on to say that that's really just a stepping stone to having a free trade deal. Uh, and, you know, if you think about it, Nigel Farage also confirmed that... Uh, that Boris deal was tolerable, particularly with the extra assurances that Boris had given about you know, just having a trading relationship going forward and not a political, um, you know, any political control coming from the EU and also, you know, having the, uh, the timeline restricted to 2020. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not about, this is not about uh, a no deal. You know, we think that Boris's deal is, is a you know, very positive way forward. John, I think you want to say. Yeah, I mean, we have to put it into context as well. You know, when the Brexit Party launched itself for the European elections, we had a Hammond May administration. That deal would have kept us in permanent orbit of the European Union, a vassal state, to coin a phrase, and would have been awful. I mean, worse than staying in, actually. The fact of the matter is that at that point, it was very clear that no deal was better than that horrendously bad deal. Uh, a WTO exit from the EU is perfectly satisfactory and the fact that it is actually possible now at the end of the negotiating period gives the government leverage in those negotiations. Bearing in mind how well they did in the very short period of time prior to this general election in getting major changes to the deal, just think how much more the progress they can make with the threat of a WTO exit. Um, right at the back. Yeah, <coughs> yes, please, hi. Gary Gibbon from Channel 4 News. Um, one of you mentioned the word pride earlier. I wonder if you can elaborate a bit more on that and how you think it is an obstacle to candidates stepping down. Is there a giant ego mm. here that needs to be discussed? <laughs> No, I, d I don't think so. I think this is all about Brexit. This is all about ordinary people having a say in Brexit. It's, it's about the ability for ordinary people to vote for something and for it to be carried through. I think it, the focus is 
has to be on that and the general election that's coming up. Um, I, I think there is a sense, as I said earlier in my speech, that, uh, you know, that perhaps the Brexit party don't feel they had recognition from the Conservative Party in helping the story move along, you know, removing Theresa May, <coughs> Boris Johnson coming to power. And um, you know, if that is the case, sometimes you have to eat your pride. You have to think about what you really want to achieve. And that's the point here. You know, even if you do feel bitter, perhaps, that is the case. And I don't know if there is that bitterness, but you know, if there is, that's not what we should be focusing on now. What we should be focusing on is how do we get to the end result as you know, the most efficient way possible. Uh, yes. Emma Murphy from ITV News. Um, senior members of the Brexit Party, who you would have counted as friends and colleagues, have described you this morning as traitors. How do you respond to that? I, naturally, I find it extremely uh, sad that they feel that's the response merited. We are doing everything we can to support the cause we joined them to support. I wish they could understand how important this election is and that really the best thing to do in order to achieve Brexit is to stop campaigning in all those seats that they cannot win. So is that your message to Nigel Farage to step away from those seats now? Absolutely. I think that it would be uh, very de it continues to be very detrimental to the hopes for Brexit campaigning against candidates who have a chance of winning and forming a government that can actually deliver it. Splitting the Leave vote is dangerous and will undo all the good the Brexit Party has done. Now is the moment to resurrect the strength and the pride the Brexit Party can have in its achievements. Um, yes. Hi, John Stevens from the Daily Mail. Um, did Nigel Farage try and do anything to persuade you not to quit? And John Longworth, to you, do you think he stripped you of the whip yesterday because he got a whiff that you were going to do this today? Um, I, <clears throat> I actually don't know the answer to that second question because the Brexit Party didn't do me the courtesy of actually speaking to me. Um, having said that, um, I think that the whip is, removal yesterday was more likely to be to do with something else. I was in Brussels yesterday uh, in a, an internal market committee meeting and I was the only Brexit Party representative, although one or two others tried to, tried to go in there to vote, were thrown out because the committee, they were not members of the committee, and um, the committee was taking a vote in secret with the declaration of the vote to be announced after the general election in the UK. Now I can't tell you what the vote was about result was because it was a secret. I couldn't tell the Brexit party what the vote was either because it was a secret and that I think is the reason that they withdrew the whip. Having, uh, what was interesting about it for me though is because the vote was directly concerned with the withdrawal agreement that the UK has <coughs> agreed with the European Union, what it said to me was very simply this, if a Brexit party MP were to be elected to the UK Parliament, given the position of the Brexit Party on that vote, they would vote against Boris Johnson's withdrawal agreement. In other words, the Brexit Party would be no better than Labour or the Liberal Democrats. So to vote for the Brexit Party, if you want Brexit, would be a very serious mistake. And what about Nigel trying to persuade you guys not to quit? Mm. Well, he didn't no. know we were quitting, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes, at the front. Thank you. Uh, Kate Devlin from The Times. Um, one of your fellow or former Brexit Party MEPs has suggested that you should stand down as MEPs. Are you going to do that? And if not, are you going to continue to work together as a group? <clears throat> um, so we're not going to stand down because we want to be in the European Parliament voting for Boris Johnson's deal. Um, that's one of the reasons. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's as simple as that. Uh, I think the Brexit Party are going to be voting against it. And, you know, for our four votes, we want to be able to use them on this one crucial occasion. Um, so it's, uh, 
you know, we, we won't be stepping down as MEPs. Uh, yes. Asa Bennett, <laughs> Telegraph. Um, so listening to you talking about your uphill battle to be able to vote for Boris Johnson's deal and to change the Brexit Party's strategy, um, it's striking then that the Brexit Party response, which I'm sure you've seen, has been very vicious and ad hominem dredging up all the links to the Conservatives you may have, Lance standing next to Michael Gove during the referendum and all sorts of crimes like that. Do you feel that you have been regarded with suspicion by Nigel Farage and his team for quite a while then? Because it seems like they've sort of expected this. Um, not really. I mean, the, the, the first time there, there was any disagreement was um, immediately after Boris came back from Brussels with his deal. Um, as I said in my speech, you know, the, the, uh, the Brexit party uh, had criticised it literally within seconds of it being announced. Um, I, I thought that it was important to look at it, consider it, uh, and decide whether or not it's something that was workable. And I felt that it was. And, and I just felt that, you know, if, if, you, want, if you want to work with somebody... It's much better to encourage them. It's better. It would have been better to say to Boris, "Listen, you've done this deal. You had your hands tied behind your back. You, you, it's actually quite a remarkable achievement that you've that you've actually done anything." Um, and we know there are problems with the deal. You must realise yourself there are problems with the deal. But let's work together and see how we can resolve those. That would have been my approach. But to say and just dismiss it as the second worst deal in history and then say, "Work with us," it was never going to work. Um, but, I, but also, I, I have to say, I don't think there could have ever been a formal alliance between the two parties. Um, there are many in the Conservative Party on the Remain side that you know, might have walked and gone to the Lib Dems if they had a formal alliance with the Brexit Party. And likewise, um, there are many Labour Brexit supporting uh, you know, Brexit uh, uh, supporters in the Brexit Party that would have said, "Hang on a second, the Brexit Party are just Tories in disguise." So I don't think there could have ever been a, a formal alliance, maybe informal on a constituency level. Um, but uh, but I think at this point in time, uh, the uh, you know if you really do believe in Brexit, you just have to vote Tory now. There's no other option. Um, can I just say we're going to take three more questions? Okay. So, uh, Theo, at the back. Thanks very much. Uh, first question to uh, Annunziata. Um, you said in your um, speech that uh, when you were out on the doorstep, Tory voters, um, people who were switching to the Brexit Party compared to the Labour Party, from, was outnumbering two to one. Nigel Farage, of course, is, uh, when he announced <coughs> that they, you wouldn't, the Brexit Party wouldn't be standing candidates uh, in Conservative-held seats, said actually he had an appeal amongst, conser amongst Labour voters. Why do you think, from your experience and from what you're hearing back, the Brexit Party, um, people who are voting for the Brexit Party, aren't necessarily Labour uh, voters? And to John Longworth, um, you uh, talked about a more, a, a more direct strategy in terms of focusing the seats. The, from the Brexit Party, from what we understand from speaking to a couple of people outside, was that if you were, if they were to be more targeted, they would breach uh, spending limits. Um, what, what's your response to that? Um, as anyone who's ever been door knocking or doing anything similar will know, it's an approximate science, but the pollsters agree it's roughly two to one, and in my experience, the backgrounds of people were more likely to be sympathetic to be cons the, to the Conservatives than to being uh, sympathetic uh, to the Labour Party. Um, th there's also certainly, without doubt, a proportion of Brexit Party supporters who wouldn't otherwise vote. Um, so they are not being taken from either. Uh, so I'm not including them in that statistic. But it, is, it seems approximately double the amount are coming from the Conservatives to those who are coming from the Labour Party. And if you look at the very tight margins in so many seats, the forecast polls, but also the feeling around the country if you talk to people, that is risking Brexit. Those changes in voting patterns, that will, the votes that will not go to the Conservative Party, which is the only party looking like winning any seats that wants to deliver Brexit, that's risking Brexit entirely. And I don't think a Brexit party should be putting Brexit itself at risk. 
Okay, two more questions. Just repeat that question. It was just on spending limits that we were speaking. Spending limits, okay. So, so they were, the <coughs> idea yeah, was no, that if you, if you shrink yeah. the number of seats, yeah. then yeah. You, they're going to yeah. reach spending limits. Well, when I suggested quite a while ago that the Brexit Party should have stood in just 20 to 30 seats. Um, seats that have very large Labour majority and a very large Leave vote would have been the ideal targets. Um, in order to uh, accomplish that, given the spending limit issue, they could simply have put up paper candidates everywhere else, basically. Now, that actually draws off votes that is to be recognised, but the Brexit Party could have made it clear where they wanted to actually win votes. You know, there are ways to do this that they could have adopted. It's too late for all that now, and actually they've, they've adopted entirely the wrong policy because they've, they've simply focused on withdrawing from Conservative seats. Uh, I, you know, I mean, I've got a list that I drew up myself, you know, West Bromwich East, West Bromwich West, Pontefract and Car Castleford, Durham North West, Barry North, Peterborough, Derby North, Derby South, Lincoln, Colne Valley, Stoke on Trent, Darlington, Wolverhampton, North East and South West, Portsmouth South, I would add Bolton North East as well, simply because I know it very well because that's where I was born. Uh, and I would say those seats are all at risk when the Conservatives can win them. Crazy. Okay, two more questions. Uh, we'll give one to Steve, and we'll give three more questions. We'll give one to that late Steve, the lady in the middle, and then Chris. Stephen from the Sun Line. Now, obviously, it's getting a bit personal with Nigel and, and everyone in the press. Do you feel that Brexit Party supporters <coughs> now are almost lions led by donkeys? You, you coined a phrase. I remember that uh, organisation was putting out mobile billboards when I was marching on the march to leave. Um, I hate this personal stuff. I mean, for me, this is all about Brexit. Uh, and I think it's very sad and actually risible in many respects that um, the Brexit party, I mean, it's in the name, isn't it, is actually putting the party above Brexit. I mean, what's that all about? Okay, and to the lady at the back, in the grey top. <laughs> um, Francis Peridin from The Guardian. Um, would you say that it's been Nigel Farage's own tactical decisions that have jeopardised Brexit? I think uh, Nigel has, as party leaders do, had pressures from lots of different opinions. I think it's fair to say all of us here have raised our concerns over the recent weeks and months <coughs> about the direction, the strategy the party was taking. There will have been a lot of people doing the exact opposite on the other side. And any leader has to make a decision, and he has. I genuinely believe that he wants an independent, sovereign, uh, uh, and great United Kingdom. I just think he is going completely the wrong way about it, and he is risking tying us to the European Union forever with a Remainer Alliance government that will never free us from the shackles of the European Union. And last, last question to Chris. <coughs> Thanks for the last second time in. If Nigel Farage were here, now, what would you say to him directly about what to do between now and election day? Very simply, I'd welcome him to the, to the table here and ask him to join us because that's got to be the right thing to do. I, I, I'm sure, you know, in his heart of hearts, he must know it. It is the right thing to do if you want to get Brexit done. Stand down candidates. He should be standing down candidates, you know. It's, well, even then, now, it's, it's too unpredictable. You know, you, you, we just don't know where things are going at the moment. And the alternative is just not a risk worth taking. So, you know, sometimes, you, you know, he might have to eat his pride. Um, but he's done, a, an, he's done an extraordinary job getting to this, you know, getting to us to this point. He could be one of the greatest statesmen if he stood down and said, I believe we have to get Brexit delivered vote for Boris Johnson and his deal. 
Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Much for Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, there's a few people that want videos. Uh, if you come to the front, and we'll go through you one by one. Thank <clears throat> you.